everyone. Welcome back for another reading lesson. I'm your teacher, Mrs. Kinman, and I hope that you're ready for a great lesson today. To get us started, I have a quote that I think we all can relate to right now. Reading gives us some place to go when we have to stay where we are. And that is a quote from Mason Cooley. We're all kind of having to stay where we are right now, right? Uh, we're getting out maybe a little bit more now, but I think we all can relate to that in a new way now. All right, let's get started. Here's what we're gonna be doing today. Of course, we're gonna start by focusing on our mindset. That's what we always do first when we start a lesson. Then we're gonna do word work, fluency practice. We're gonna take the reading comprehension skill that we worked on yesterday and we're gonna add on today. We're still gonna be finding evidence to help us answer questions about nonfiction text, but we're focusing specifically on chronological order, which means time order. In other words, sequence. And then of course, we'll wrap up with a check for understanding. So let's get started by first, of course, focusing on our learning gems. I want you to think about your learning gems anytime you're getting ready to learn something new. It really just helps us focus and be in a good spot in our mind. So I'm gonna share with you my learning gems. I am really grateful for my family. I have a really big family. Um, but they're awesome and I love them. And I just know that's something that I take for granted sometimes. And I know that I need to remember to be grateful for my family. I'm excited because we took some new family pictures this weekend. It had been a while since we had done that. And so I was excited about that. Something that I'm motivated to do is to finish my summer lessons, finish our planning. We're already on lesson six now. We only have two more to go, and I'm really motivated to get those planned and make sure that they're awesome for you. A success that I can celebrate is that I figured out how to put my Bitmoji in my Google Slides. I was so excited. Did you see whenever it said hi on the first slide? It just really made me happy. I definitely consider that a success for my week. So reflect on your own learning gems and get into a really positive mindset. Let's get started with our whole body listening. We're gonna review these eight points of whole body listening to make sure that you are in the best mindset possible for learning. Make sure you're listening with your eyes by facing me. Make sure you're listening with your ears. Make sure that you're ready to hear. If you're listening with those ears, that means that your mouth is quiet, waiting for your turn to talk. Your hands and feet are quiet and still into yourself. Um, your body is facing toward the speaker, just like I'm facing toward you. Your brain is thinking about the lesson. Remember, we're always using that thinking voice. We gotta be thinking about the lesson in order to learn best. And our heart is open. We're considering what the speaker is saying and you are open-minded and ready to learn. All right, so now that we have that focus where it needs to be, let's get started. Today in our word work, we're gonna be looking at a type of word relationship, homographs. Homographs are two or more words that are spelled the same. They are not necessarily pronounced the same, although they can be, uh, but they have different meanings. So homographs means they're spelled the same. They have different meanings. Let's take a look at some examples. Bear and bear. One type of bear is an animal that we see in the woods. Another type of bear is like, I just can't bear to see you sad, like I can't stand it. All right, they, these are pronounced the same. They're spelled the same, but they have very different meanings. Let's look at an example where they are not pronounced the same. We have close, like remember social distancing and don't stand too close. See, that's an example I never would have used even six months ago, and now it's one we all can relate to. So close can mean near, or close, like please close the door. So they are spelled the same, they are pronounced differently, but most importantly, they have different meanings. Lead, lead. Please lead the class down the hallway and your pencil lead needs to be sharpened. Homographs are really important for readers. Why do you think that is? Well, in order for us to comprehend what we're reading, we have to know what the words mean. That's why having knowledge that some words are spelled the same but have different meanings is so important. 
So I'm gonna show you some examples and I want you to try to read the words and then think of the two different meanings that those words could be representing. Ready? Let's get started. These words are skip and skip. They are pronounced the same. They're definitely spelled the same, but one means like skipping through the gym and another skip could mean that you're missing something. Like I'm going to skip recess to help my teacher with a project. Different meanings. Let's try another pair. Fair and fair. This is like I'm going to the fair, like a carnival. And then another meaning of fair is something that is just, like please be fair when you're dividing your candy with your siblings. Train and train. One type of train is like a locomotive, choo-choo. And another train is like to learn something new, like I'm going to train with a special basketball coach. How about this one? Blue and blue. One is the color blue. The other one is like sadness, like I was feeling blue because it was raining outside. Lie and lie. Like I told my dog to lie down on the sofa and I told a lie, which meant I was not honest. They're spelled the same, they're pronounced the same, but they have very different meanings. Oftentimes, they're even different parts of speech. All right, now we're ready for our fluency practice. We have the same passage that we read yesterday. So now this is our second read. It's a little bit more familiar to us now, so it should be a little bit easier for you to read smoothly and accurately. I still have those words with the syllable patterns that we learned yesterday. I still have those highlighted because I want you to pay special attention to those pronunciations. Okay, map tools, are you ready to read? Let's begin. Maps help us find places when we travel. They show us how many miles one place is from another place. They show us how land areas look from above. Markings on a map stand for real places in the world. Many maps have a tool called a key. The key tells us what the markings on the map mean. For example, blue lines may show rivers. Reading a map may seem difficult, but a map's tools make it easier to use. How did you do? I bet that you did great. Nice work. Okay, remember, we're kind of doing the same skill as yesterday, but we're taking it just one step further. We are gonna be using evidence and sequence of events in order to analyze text and answer questions. So remember, nonfiction text, we're gonna think about the filing cabinet. What kind of thinking voice do we need to have as we're reading in order to comprehend that nonfiction text the best? What kind of questions are we gonna be asking ourselves? In our video today, I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about it first. First of all, I know that the question being asked and the text example that they use is a little bit challenging. It's definitely above a third grade level, but that's okay. You don't have to read it independently. You're not gonna be answering the same kind of question, so it's okay. But I, what, what I want you to pay very close attention to is the thought process that they're talking about in order to analyze the text and pay attention to the sequence of events in order to help them answer that question. That's the skill that is modeled that I really want you to pay attention to. And also at the end, it says that we should pause the video in order to read their whole response or their whole answer to the question. I'm not gonna pause the video because you don't need to read the whole answer to the question. Remember, we're just focusing on the thought process and um, looking at how we use this skill in a real life example, okay? So let's watch the video.
in the conflict of Tinker v. Des Moines Independent Community School District, what was the United States Supreme Court ruling? In this lesson, you will learn how to analyze a sequence of events by linking specific details in the text to a final outcome. We have been reading the Supreme Court ruling, Tinker v. Des Moines Independent Community School District. This informational text defined the constitutional rights of students in the United States public schools by looking at whether the school's disciplinary actions violate First Amendment rights. The opinion was written by Supreme Court Justice Fortas, and the case was argued on November 12, 1968. Let's review what we already know readers do. Authors reveal how specific events lead to the final outcome. Readers will identify the main events in a text and analyze how each event eventually led to the final outcome. Having this knowledge will provide a more thorough understanding of the entire piece. Before we dive into the core lesson, let's quickly review First Amendment rights. According to the very first amendment to the United States Constitution, the freedom of speech, press, religion, assembly, and petition are protected. Today, we're going to be exploring our question by using these three steps to guide us. First, reread the text to identify key individuals and the conflict. Then ask, how do the sequence of events unfold? Finally, ask, how do the interactions of the individuals and the sequence of events lead to the final outcome? In the conflict of Tinker versus the Des Moines Independent Community School District, what was the United States Supreme Court ruling? We are going to closely reread the text in order to answer this question. Our first step is to reread the text and identify key individuals and the conflict. Let's start by identifying the main people involved. I'm going to highlight the people and underline any important information about that person. Within the very first page of the document, I was able to identify John F. Tinker, a 15-year-old high school student, Christopher Eckert, a 16-year-old high school student, Mary Beth Tinker, John's sister and a 13-year-old middle school student, and the principals of the Des Moines schools. The students are going to be referred to as the petitioners because they are the ones petitioning for legal action in this case. Now, let's move on by rereading this section again to see if we can identify and highlight the conflict between the petitioners and the principals. I see here that the students met at Christopher Eckert's home and decided to protest the Vietnam War by wearing black armbands during the holiday season and fasting on specific days. Here's where the conflict occurs. The principals found out about the protest and adopted a policy two days before the protest that any student wearing an armband and refusing to remove it would be suspended from school until they return without the armbands. The next step is to ask, how do the sequence of events unfold? In order to identify the events that follow the initial conflict, I must review the text until I come across the very first event that resulted from the initial conflict. The very first event resulting from the conflict between the petitioners and the school principals occurs on page one. As I reread this part of the text, I know the main event is that on December 16th, Mary Beth and Christopher wore black armbands to their schools. John Tinker wore his armband the next day. They were all sent home and suspended from school. Now I have to put all this information into my own words as a note. In summary, the petitioners were suspended by the principals for their protest. I'm going to visualize my findings. The first major event that resulted from the conflict was that the petitioners were suspended by the principals for their protest. In order to process this event, I'm going to make any statements and or ask any questions that I have. The first event led me to question, was the principal suspension of the petitioners constitutional? I'm going to continue to identify the events that resulted from the conflict. The next sequence of events can be found on page two. As I reread this part of the text, I'm able to answer 
how the conflict ended up in the court system. I know that a complaint was filed in the United States District Court by the petitioners and the District Court dismissed the complaint because the actions of the school was reasonable in order to prevent disturbance of school discipline. Now I have to put this information into my own words as a note. In summary, the petitioners brought the conflict to the District Court and the district court ruled in favor of the officials because of a possible disruption. I'm continuing my visualization of the events. The next event that resulted from the conflict was that the petitioners brought their conflict to the district court who ruled in favor of the school officials because of a possible disruption. As I continue to process the events, I'll make any statements and or ask any questions that I have. The events led me to think that the petitioners didn't really think their suspension was constitutional, so that's why they went to the district court. Then I thought, the students didn't cause a disruption, but the possibility of one was apparently reason enough for the district court. So I, then I wonder, do I agree with their ruling? The next sequence of events can be found on page 3. As I reread this part of the text, I'm able to answer how the process progressed. I read that the petitioners appealed and the Court of Appeals considered the case on banc, which means that all judges will need to hear the case. The court was equally divided and the Supreme Court granted certiorari, which means that the case is moving up to a higher court. Now, I have to put this information into my own words as a note. In summary, the petitioners appealed the court was divided, and the case was brought to the Supreme Court. I'm still in the process of visualizing my findings. The next event that resulted from the conflict was that the petitioners appealed, the court was divided, and the case was brought to the Supreme Court. Once again, I'm going to process the events and make any statements and or ask any questions that I have. I thought to myself, the case had divided opinions and the Supreme Court took the case, which means they are challenging the lower court, the district court. I wonder why the Supreme Court didn't agree with the lower courts. I also wonder why the Supreme Court took this case on. The final sequence of events and the final outcome of events can also be found on page 3. As I reread this part of the text, I'm wondering what the final outcome of all the events is going to be. The Supreme Court states that the wearing of armbands is entirely divorced from actually or potentially disruptive conduct by those participating in it and is entitled to comprehensive protection under the First Amendment. I now realize that the actions of the school authorities was not constitutional. Now, I have to put this information in my own words as a note. In summary, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the petitioners because the protest did not cause a disruption and is therefore protected by First Amendment rights. We are asking ourselves, how did the interaction of the individuals and the sequence of events lead to the final outcome? First, the petitioners were suspended by the principals for the protest. They then brought their conflict to the district court because they thought their rights were being violated. The district court ruled in favor of the school officials because that court ruled the protest was a possible disruption. Then, unhappy with the decision, the petitioners appealed the case to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court took the case, ultimately ruling in favor of the petitioners because the court decided the protest did not cause a disruption and is in fact protected by their First Amendment rights. When processing all the events together, I can see how the conflict started at a local level and then moved up to the highest federal court based on a legal process meant to ensure the protection of constitutional rights. Now that we've completed each step for the text, the last step is to jot or write this thinking down. First, I want to review the original question. In the conflict of Tinker versus the Des Moines Independent Community School District, what was the Supreme Court ruling? We have all the necessary information to compose a written response. So, how should I compose my response to this question? I'm going to start by answering the question. As evidence, I'll follow the sequence of events, citing specific details from the text. 
Then I'll complete the response with the answer to the question that also includes the reason. Here is the answer I composed. Please pause the video to read the answer and then hit play to continue. We explored a question by using these three steps to guide us. First, we reread the text to identify key individuals and the conflict. Then we asked ourselves, how did the sequence of events unfold? Finally, we asked, how do the interactions of the individuals and the sequence of events lead to the final outcome? In this lesson, you have learned how to analyze a sequence of events by linking specific key details in the text to a final outcome. All right, so I hope that you were able to get some great learning from that video. They showed us the steps, the explicit steps that they took to pull evidence out of the text, put it in a sequence of events, and then use that to answer a question about the text. Now we're going to look at this text about wildfires, and then we're going to answer a few questions. We're going to think about the sequence of events to help us do this. First, let's read. Wildfires are a pretty common event. It is estimated that over 100,000 fires happen each year in the United States alone. So how do they begin? First, there may be a lack of water in an area. This is known as a drought. During this time, the land is very dry and can easily catch fire. Next, something has to cause the fire to begin. 90% of the time, it is humans. Forgetting to put out a campfire or throwing away a burning cigarette can cause the land to go up in flames. After the fire begins, it takes an extraordinary effort to put them out. Wind can push the fire along at speeds quicker than firefighters can put them out, especially in areas with lots of trees and vegetation. If a wildfire continues to spread, it can cause incredible amounts of damage to forests and homes. Yellowstone Summer of Fire In the summer of 1988, Yellowstone's worst fire ever burned more than 1 million acres of land in the National Forest. Check out this timeline to see how the fire advanced. So this timeline is reading from left to right, and then it goes down here just for space. So after a very dry summer, lightning strikes began. The wildfires were spreading even quicker than before. Firefighters try to fight the fire. 100,000 acres of land burned. The fire became national news. People living near the fire began packing their things and moving. And then in September, the first snowfall of the year finally put the flames out. Let's look at the sequence of events as we answer a couple questions together. It says, write the three steps of a wildfire according to the passage. So I can look back and find that sequence of events to help us. First, there might be a lack of water in the area or a drought. Then something has to cause the fire to begin. Remember, it said it was usually humans. And then last, the fire spreads, and then it takes a huge effort in order to put it out. According to the timeline, what event started the 1988 Yellowstone fires? Well, started, I'm thinking beginning. And I looked at the beginning of the timeline to see that lightning strikes began a small fire. What happened after the fire became national news? Well, here on the timeline, it talks about national news. What happened next? People living near the fire began packing their things. And last, when did the fire finally go out? I'm going to look at my timeline at the very end on September 11th, 1988. All right, so let's check for understanding. Which of the following is not an example of a sequence word? Get your fist ready. A, first, B, maybe, C, then, or D, finally? One, two, three, respond. Maybe is not an example of a sequence word. That's not a word that's going to help you determine the order of events. All the other ones are, though. Let's ask another question. One way to analyze text to help answer questions about it is to pay attention to the sequence of events. Is that A, true, or B, false? One, two, three, respond. That is true. Definitely a way that you can answer questions about text is to pay attention to the sequence of events. We saw a great example of that and we practiced it together. So that's what your at-home practice is going to be about today. Remember, when we answer questions about nonfiction text, we use text evidence to support our answers, and we pay attention to the sequence of events. 
So you are going to read this article about Neil Armstrong. Remember, it's a nonfiction article. It's full of facts and real events. And then you're going to use sequence and evidence from the text to complete a timeline about his life. So your events are going to start here. The next event goes here. The next event goes here. The next event goes here. And your last one will go here. Remember to analyze that text closely as you're filling out that timeline. Awesome work today. Thank you so much for working hard with me. You should be really proud of everything that you've accomplished so far this summer. Your code word for today is wildfire. I hope that you have a great day and I will see you next week. Bye everybody.